So thank you again very much, Amber, for making time for speaking to us about your view on the Universal Code of Conduct. And the first thing I would like to know is how you, did you become aware that there is work going on by the foundation around a Universal Code of Conduct? Um, my colleague, Melissa Tamani, was made aware through the user group that she's part of in Peru. And they were, uh, they were reached out to in Spanish to participate in a preliminary survey. And at that point, she brought that information to Art and Feminism because she was confused why we hadn't heard of it. We later found out it's because um, non-dominant languages were contacted first. So at that point, we had developed the safety tab. Uh, we had a document going. Uh, we were taking in cases and, and guiding people through all the material is coming from trust and safety. It's not new material, but it's just, it's an easier pathway for folks. So at that point we reached out to Patrick and we met with Patrick and Mervat and also with Maggie Nelson to discuss possibly being involved. So just for anyone who's viewing this, who might not be familiar with Patrick and Mervat, they are also on the trust and safety team. Patrick is my manager, Mervat is a facilitator who was doing some of those initial outreach things. Yeah. Um, what do you think, if such a universal code of conduct indeed comes into being, what impact would it have, especially on those communities that you work mostly with, with those, it's not really communities, but it's parts of communities? Yeah. So. I mean, we work with many different types of communities. A big one that we work with are new editors because part of our mandate is to train new people. And I think that the biggest hurdle that people have um, when there's any perceived harassment or even just like conflict, um, so downgrading it from harassment to any kind of conflict or uncertainty, they don't know how to access information that can help guide them through the process. It's all there on Wiki. But unless you have a certain amount of expertise using uh, that kind of platform and the interface of it, which you don't if you're a new editor, it will be very hard to find. And the language of experienced editors can often um, be more confusing and frustrating and intimidating, uh, even when it's not meant to be. So we assume good faith. We assume that anybody interacting is operating in good faith. Uh, but we know how intimidating it can seem even in the nicest moment. So we hope that a universal code of conduct, and it's hard to say because we don't know how it will be implemented, but we hope that it will be something that will make access to this information easier and, um, and more consistent. So that's a big thing. But then there's also folks who are active editors and have been involved for a long time, and many of whom do experience some form of bad behavior. Uh, and that could be, um, Something that I've experienced is any time I post around International Women's Day, everything I post is immediately flagged for deletion. Just across the board, <laughs> everything. Um, I don't think it's because I'm a consistently bad editor. I think it's just something that happens. And of course, these articles aren't deleted and it's fine in the end, but it's an extra layer of work. And so I think that a universal code of conduct will potentially help to limit those types of interactions. We do have conduct codes, there are policies in place, but they're not familiar to everyone and they're not always accessible. And I would add to that, that some of the policies are policies that like have weight to them. And some of them are just things that people have written because they feel like it, you know, they're, they're driven by personal interest, but they're not backed by any kind of um, committee or, or any kind of power. So while they are great and there's lots of good information in them, they're not followed. So it will help make it more consistent as well what the pathways are. Do you also think um, that Wikimedians, if they go outside their home wiki, um, often they start with one wiki, but then they discover there's also other places to edit either in another language. If they're not um, English speakers, they might start with a small local wiki and go to English Wikipedia later, mm -hmm. or they will go through the other projects, comments, Wikidata, whatever. Do you think it will change something for people if they go to those 
projects around their I home think, wiki? I think it definitely can because yeah, there's lots of inconsistencies between what's tolerated in one wiki versus another. I work in English and French and I've seen very, very big differences in what is permitted and also in how things are engaged. I think it also could potentially allow um, for the, the privilege that you have generally as a Wikipedia user to carry over. That's something that could happen. So that could be a benefit. If you're new to a new to another language, but you've had a lot of experience, you're going to be able to demonstrate some of that experience elsewhere. Because so much of the way that we work is experience based and how long you've been involved. And we'd obviously love to diminish that. Um, I think that would be a good thing overall. But I think there's lots of benefits to being able to demonstrate that you have been there for a long time and you do know what you're doing. Definitely, yes. Um, that was already a lot of insights, but is there anything else you wanted to share about the concept of a universal code of conduct? Right now, it's very hard for me to see exactly how it will work because we don't have the code in front of us and we don't know how it will be implemented. The information that we've been given, um, you know, it's very hopeful and we are entering into this process with 100% the belief that this is only a good thing, that's, that it's only positive for the community. And I should say that we've um, engaged a, a survey of users of art and feminism so that we're providing you with a written statement from all those users, but so that you have um, not just the like six people or seven people that we work with regularly, but a wide community view. And we also held a, like an office hour around it as well. And not everybody thought that it was a good thing. Some people thought it was a bad thing because it could not be implemented. It would never happen. So there, we do have, you know, some pushback around that and we want to see how that will be put into place. <laughs> you know, we're going into it with a lot of hope, but we, but um, I would, I would add to that, that some of the pushback is not so much around the concept of a universal code of conduct, but the way that it's being organized. So there is a lot of, as I'm sure you're aware, mistrust of trust and safety for a variety of reasons. And it's hard to imagine how a project that's guided by the foundation, but that is meant to affect the community and the movement is going to be received by the movement when there's so little trust between them. And something has, I think something has to change in that trust relationship and that like, what seems to me like a real fight for power constantly, how we can overcome that in order to make the community healthier for everyone. But that seems like separate from the universal code of conduct. It's putting the cart before the horse. It has to happen now, but. I'm not sure. And I also hope that the universal code of conduct will be one step yeah. that will help create trust. This is at least the way we try to go about it. We know that it's um, there's a lot of very different things going on and it's a very complex question, this question of trust. But yes. um, we are trying to, to engage with community and to not make this a top-down thing, but to make it really a joint effort. And we And we see that. At Art and Feminism, we see that work happening, just so that you know, like it's visible to us and we acknowledge it. I'm just, I'm also noting what we're getting from our community, which is, and something that we've experienced ourselves. We've reached out to Trust and Safety in the past and we haven't always uh, had follow through with, with the process. Yes, I think yeah. we have to acknowledge that those things did not always go the way they were intended to and the yeah. way people hoped they would work in the past. Yeah. And I think, yeah, we all operate with good faith. We're all doing it because nobody's here because they, you know, hate this movement. They're here because they love it and they want to see it work. And yeah, perhaps it's good to go back to that part of where you said you have hope. Yeah, and we have I have hope. so much. 
And with this hope, I think there is a good chance of this indeed becoming something that will move forward with trust and make the movement, what did you say before? Improve community health across the movement? Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. And I, I hope that this can shift some of this um, fight for power. Because what I see it as is a real uh, constant fight for who's in charge of this project and who's responsible for it. Is it the foundation or is it the movement members? Is it the users? Um, and I think that once we equalize that power a little bit more and, and clarify it, yeah, we'll have something we positive. We can overcome the stage of constant jostling. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for those insights. You're welcome.